Well, it was Tuesday, of course, in this last week in the life of Jesus before the cross on Friday. He spends the whole day teaching. He's walking out of the temple courts with his disciples who remark at the beauty of the buildings that the temple was. And Jesus says to them that the, the temple that they've just been around all day is going to be destroyed. And they say to Jesus, when? You can feel the, the tension of that moment as Jesus then walks with his disciples out of the city and into a valley called the Kidron and walks up the hill called the Mount of Olives. You get to the top of any kind of hill, you want to take a break, <laughs> take a deep breath, <sighs> and sit down. And there, Jesus will utter his last words of Tuesday, the last words that are part of that public ministry before all the events that will happen that week that will lead to the cross. As he sits there, he will, he will answer the question that the disciples just uh, asked, when, when is the temple going to be destroyed? And he says, well, don't worry about it. There's going to be all these things that are going to happen. There's going to be wars and earthquakes and famines and lots of different things, but don't be alarmed. And then as he goes through all this litany of things, he begins to describe what actually will happen 40 years later when Jerusalem will be surrounded by Roman armies, its walls taken down, the temple burned and destroyed, starting in the spring of 70 AD and then finalized in August of that, that year. The things that Jesus says are going to happen, happened. And they actually happened 40 years after the time Jesus predicted them, which is interesting because in this chapter he says it's going to happen within a generation. Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and it's an incredible fulfillment of prophecy. Today, the prophecy Jesus made is now a matter of history. But we call this whole chapter the, in this series the end times. And the question is, it, how can it be the end if it happened back then? And what is going to happen in the future? And over the last three weeks, we've looked at how scriptures in times have been fulfilled, but now we're going to look into the future from where we stand. The title of our message today is called The End of Days, Now and Not Yet. And I want to pick up reading in verse 24. We're just going to read a little bit of this, and then we're going to dive right in. It says in verse 24, but in those days, following that distress. In those days, after all the things I've said are going to happen, distress in the original language, the language of the people of the time, the Greek language, is thlipsis, means tribulation, after the tribulation. And then in my Bible, it, it puts this in, in quotation marks, and it, and it puts it in the middle of my page to signal the fact that this is actually a quote from the Old Testament. It's from Isaiah. The sun will be darkened and the, the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the, the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man. The, the word see there is the primary word in this whole chapter, to, to look, to be watchful. At that time, people will, will see what Jesus calls the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and he will gather his elect from the four winds. Four winds is a kind of an old way of saying from the whole world, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heaven. Uh, what Jesus is saying in this passage is there's some things that we need to see when this event takes place. And so today what I want us to do is see the things Jesus tells us we're supposed to see. So see what he, first of all, I would call here the, the cosmic sign. This is the language of the cosmos, of the world, of, the, of, of, of when you look at the night sky, what you see kind of thing. Jesus describes here cosmic events. The sun is dark and the moon doesn't give its light. Stars fall from the sky. When we hear of a, a moon darkened, we might think of this image, the lunar eclipse that takes place. This is uh, when a lunar eclipse happens, there's a strange phenomenon sometimes called a blood moon because the the, the, the blocking of the, of the sun creates a visual effect on the moon. Or we may read here where the sun is darkened and think of a solar eclipse, right? We can show you what that looks like. There's not much to see because the sun is, is being blocked. And 
some of us in this room have experienced solar eclipses, and not too long ago, the whole of most of North America got to experience a very significant one. Or when it talks about the stars falling from the sky, we may think of an image like this, and this could be something like a a meteor coming into the atmosphere, or an asteroid, or some space junk, one of those cell phone, you know, satellites up there gets old and falls into the sky and disintegrates, and we sometimes see this kind of debris coming down in the sky, the, the stars fall from the sky. In other words, what's being described here as we read it It sounds to us a lot like the kinds of astronomical events that we would sometimes see. But what Jesus is saying here is actually a quote from the Old Testament. It's actually a quotation from two places in Isaiah. First of all, Isaiah chapter 13, verse 10, which says, The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Go back and read Isaiah sometime. And you'll see that he wasn't talking about things in the sky. He was using cosmic language to describe what God was getting ready to do in the world. Isaiah 34, 4 is the other one that's quoted here. All the stars in the sky will be dissolved. The heavens will be rolled up like a scroll. The starry host will fall like withered leaves from the vine, like shriveled figs from the fig tree. Again, he's using the language of the God of history doing some kind of judgment thing in the present. That is what this passage is describing. And then finally you get to the end where it says, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And here there's something kind of lost in translation. Because the word bodies in the original language, dunamis, means powers. It's not talking about like just stuff in the sky. It's talking about not the world that we just see with a telescope, but the unseen world. The Bible uses the language to describe the powers and principalities of the world, these these enemies that we can't see, an invisible force of, of, of spiritual darkness that we're always at war with, whether we realize it or not. And here, it's describing a moment when those powers will be shaken. They will be stirred. They will be brought because the, the judgment of God is coming upon them and God's world. Now, that's what Jesus is kind of getting at in this passage, but through the years, people have really taken this this kind of passage in really strange directions. I told you before that there's a tendency among some to really try to sensationalize these kinds of verses in the Bible. There's a parallel text to this in the book of Revelation, which talks about not the, 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 the moon being darkened, but the moon being turned to blood. This inspired a well-known San Antonio pastor to write a best-selling book called Four Blood Moons. It's John Hagee, you know, the, the came out in uh, about, a, about eight years ago now and really got everyone's attention because he claimed that the events described in the book here and in the book of Revelation, chapter six, corresponded to these four blood moons that would come out in these four different dates in 2014 and 2015. These strange, he called astronomical cosmic events, signaled the events of the Bible and the end times happening. And a lot of people were interested. I decided to tune in. Maybe you watched that too, I don't know. But on the night of the big broadcast about all that was happening, he invited to the panel a a well-known Christian astronomer, a scientist. And he asked the scientist what he thought about his own book and his observations. And the scientist said, I hate to tell you this, but I don't agree at all. I don't agree with your interpretation of the Bible, and I don't agree with your understanding of science. He said, first of all, this thing you call blood moons are really not all that uncommon. They're not unusual at all in history. They happen, like, all the time. It's not that big of a deal. But he says, most importantly, is you fail to realize that the four blood moons that you're talking about are not visible in the city of Jerusalem. They're not visible in Israel at all. And as I was watching this, I watched the blood drain from his face (laughs) to realize that he was just totally wrong. And it's a reminder to me, and it ought to be a cautionary tale to all of us, that the one thing that's been true for 2,000 years of people sensationalizing this part of the Bible is they have all been the same thing. They've all come to the same realization, and that is that they have all been proven wrong. The, the, one of the things the text will tell us is we need to be careful about interpreting this, the, these kind of quote-unquote cosmic signs because what Jesus is dealing with in this passage is not 
history, it's meta-history. He's using symbolic language that people refer to as apocalyptic. It's imagery meant to bring home a point that the God of history is going to become even the judge of his own world and that even the powers will be shaken by the God. But this isn't really the point that Jesus is making. This is just an introduction to the real point he wants us to see or the real sign he needs us to see here, which I call the cloud sign. In verse 26 and 27, he says, and at that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. When Jesus says this, he is invoking the language of the Old Testament. He is citing one of the most familiar passages in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel, where Daniel has a, a vision. He sees something, and he writes it down. This is Daniel 7, 13. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. Put another way, when I looked at him, he looked like a human being. Coming with the clouds of heaven. Not something we normally see. We don't look up in the sky and see some guy flying through the sky. That would, to us, feel more like a Marvel movie or a DC kind of thing than what we would normally experience. But he says, I see one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. Not only that, but he says he approached the ancient of days. This is a Jewish way of talking about God, not using his holy name, the almighty, omnipotent, all-powerful God. This human being went through the sky and into his very presence, and he was led into God's presence. Here is a human going into the presence of God himself. Well, it's interesting because Jesus alludes to that here in reference to himself, that he would be a human who would be able to enter the presence of God. And in fact, at the end of this week, or near the end of it, Jesus will again refer back to that. He says this on Tuesday night, Thursday night, he'll have the Last Supper with his disciples, go to the Garden of Gethsemane, he'll be arrested and taken before a trial for the religious leaders, and they'll ask him some questions, and he'll allude to that passage here. This is Mark chapter 14, verse 61. But Jesus remained silent, and he gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, asked Jesus, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus is referring back to that prophecy, back to that vision of a, of a human being who's able to enter into the divine presence of God, coming on the clouds of heaven. You're going to see that. And in fact, go to the last book in our Bible, the book of Revelation, John's on the island of Patmos, and he has a vision, and he writes it down, and this is the opening verses of Revelation, Revelation 1-7. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him, even the people that were there when Jesus was being crucified at the cross, they will witness him coming. Jesus, who was so humbled in his death on a cross and rejected his killed as a, as a criminal, who was brought low in a shameful way, who came up from the dead but has now ascended to heaven. He will come again in power and in glory. And those who pierced him, even they will see him. And all the peoples on earth will mourn because of him. Why will they mourn? They will mourn because they rejected him, because they didn't accept him, because they missed out on the opportunity to make Jesus Christ their Lord. So shall it be, it says, amen. Now, this comes up again in one of the most um, important moments that we read about in the New Testament when the Apostle Paul was in the midst of his missionary work and he had brought the gospel to places for the very first time. He, he came to, to, to Greece, to Macedonia, and he came to a city called Thessalonica and he told them about Jesus and he brought this message as well. After he left, Paul traveled down through into Greece, the southern part of Greece, in a place called Achaia, in this famous city called Athens. And he got a word that some people had died in the church at Thessalonica. He sat down and he wrote a letter that was then brought to the church and read to comfort them because they were f fearful that they had missed out on this thing called the coming of Jesus, coming in the clouds. That, hey, they, they died. They're going to miss out on this amazing event. 
But Paul says, no, they won't. Listen to what he says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 15, 16, and 17. According to the Lord's word, and we can look at this passage as one of those examples of that, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep or have died. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with a voice of the archangel. Go read the book of Daniel, the 12th chapter, and you'll know that guy's name is Michael. And with a trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and her left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. In other words, this message that Uh, This core message of the early Christians was the belief in what Jesus was saying in this passage, that he's coming back. We call this the return of Christ, the second coming of Jesus. We call it, in Greek, the parousia, the appearing of Jesus. This is one of the core beliefs that we have as Christians, is that one day he is coming back. But you know, it's incredible that Jesus is saying that to his disciples. You know why? Because they didn't even know he was going. This is Tuesday, and they have no idea, even though he's told them on Friday that he's going to die, they don't know he's going to die. They don't know he's going to be put in the tomb. They don't know in a few days later he's going to send into heaven and be gone. They don't know that he's leaving, he's dying, he's rising, all those things. So they especially don't understand what he says, that he is coming with the clouds of heaven. But we know it. They were wanting to know the answer to one question. <laughs> hey, uh, when's the temple going to get destroyed? We don't wonder that question. You know why? Because in history, we know it was destroyed. We know that in 70 AD, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. We know that the prophecy he makes here was fulfilled. But what we want to know is the answer to the question, when is he coming back? When is the second coming going to happen? And to that, Jesus begins to use another set of images. And I want to share with you what I call here, see the seasonal sign, because that's what happens afterwards. Uh, We're not going to put these verses on the screen. If you have a Bible, you're welcome to follow along with me, but I want to read it to you, because I want to remind you of the fact that the earliest people who who experienced this didn't have a printed text. The disciples, when Jesus said it, didn't have a printed text, and so they had to just listen. So listen to what Jesus says. Verse 28 Now learn this lesson, the original word is parable, from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. That's because a fig tree is a deciduous tree. It's an indication that summer is going to happen. It's it's early leaves indicate it. Even so, he says, when you see these things happening, you know that it's near right at the door. Truly, I tell you, he says, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. You know, if you're reading that and you read the whole chapter and you aren't really aware of what Jesus is doing in this chapter, you might really get confused. That's what happened to one of America's most famous atheists, a philosopher of the 20th century named Bertrand Russell. He wrote a book called Why I'm Not a Christian. And part of the argument that he makes in the book for why he's not a Christian is because he says Jesus got his own second coming wrong. And he quotes this particular passage of scripture. He said, quote, I'm concerned with Christ as he appears in the gospels. He certainly thought his second coming would occur in the clouds and glory before the death of all people who were living at that time. In other words, what Bertrand Russell does is he says, you know what, when Jesus says this is going to happen within a generation, he connects that quote with the event just described, the return of Christ. What Bertrand Russell doesn't do is he doesn't read carefully. Because if you actually look at the text when it says, truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things, these things is referring back to what Jesus was saying to his disciples when they asked about the destruction of the temple, and he says, well, let me tell you about these things in verses three and four. So a careful reading of this helps us avoid making that mistake. 
And so when Jesus uses this image here of a fig tree, one way to understand this is that this fruit, when it appears, it appears to signal an event that is near. Well, when you see the fig tree, he says, you know it's near. It's not immediate, but it is imminent. The fig tree is a way of saying, look, when you see this, know it's coming, but it's in no way an indication of when it's going to come. You say, how do you know that? Because of what Jesus says next. Listen to the rest of the chapter. Verse 32. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father and a best-selling author somewhere. I'm always tempted to add that in. No one knows. Jesus doesn't even know, which you can try to figure that out in your mind, like how is it that Jesus couldn't have known, and we'd have to do a whole other sermon on, on the incarnation, what it means for God to become a man. But if Jesus doesn't know, then how can someone else, hundreds of years later, reading this verse of scripture say, well, I was reading what Jesus says, and now I've figured it out. You can't. And saying you can is actually contradicting what the text is telling us, isn't it? In fact, it's Jesus' warning in verse 33, be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a, a man going away. He leaves his house. He puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and he tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether it's in the evening or at midnight, when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly... Do not let him find you sleeping. And what I say to everyone, I, what I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. That's the big theme of this chapter. Peel your eyes. Be ever vigilant with what you're doing to be prepared. Jesus doesn't know. They don't know. But, but, but that doesn't stop them from asking when. You know, after the cross and the empty tomb and the disciples were with Jesus for a period of days, they didn't know that he was leaving, but again, they were standing with him in Acts chapter one on the Mount of Olives, the same location. And he'll ascend to heaven from the Mount of Olives. Right before he does, the disciples ask Jesus again, when are you gonna do all this stuff? When is the kingdom of God gonna come? And in Acts chapter one, verse seven, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. And not only does he not know, but it isn't even for you to know. This is not in the realm of your capability or responsibility. That's not your job. You know what your job is? He gives Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. It's your job to be the witness. Leave the timing up to God. When Paul gave his great instruction that I just read to you in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he follows it up in 1 Thessalonians 5 by giving this caution. Now, brothers and sisters, 1 Thessalonians 5.1, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. You're not going to know when it's going to happen. Therefore, you have to be ever ready. You need to live every day with a recognition that that could be the day. And so, therefore, now is our time to prepare now is the moment in which we should be prepared, if you will, to meet Jesus. There, there's a, this interesting phrase occurs also in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, you remember about the tribes, the different tribes in Israel, the tribes of Reuben and Judah. And the, there's a tribe called the tribe of Issachar. There's not much mentioned in the Bible about it, but in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, it says this. It's one of my favorite verses in the book of Chronicles. It says, from the tribe of Issachar, there were 200 leaders, and all these men understood the signs of the times, and they knew the best course for Israel to take. It doesn't say much about them, but it says that there was a group of, of individuals living in those days who understood what it was like to live in the times that they lived in. And they knew how to lead. They knew how to do the right thing. The question for us living in these days, the end times now and not yet, is a, is, is a question of our responsibility. 
It's a question of are we a generation who is aware of this and are we following in the right course that we need to take? The challenge for us today is to be ready for that. And my question for you is, are you ready for that day? Are you prepared for that moment? Are you right now ready to experience what Jesus is describing in this passage? And if not, don't you think today is the day in which you should do that? Now, as I say that to you, I also am aware that as we've talked about this over the last three or four weeks, some of you may be saying to yourself, there's some things I don't understand. To which I want to say, me too. (laughs) A lot I don't understand. But there's more to be said, and so I'm sort of excited in a way to be able to announce to you that as we start back all of our Bible studies this Wednesday night, that before all of the regularly scheduled activities, uh, I'll be teaching in my pastor's Bible study from 6 o'clock to 6.30 on this very theme called the end times. And it's not just a repeat of this. In fact, it's totally different. We're going to be looking at all sorts of big questions about what happens when we die and what is heaven and what is hell and what are all these big things, as well as the, the big events, the, 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 the big events that are happening, but also the personal and individual events. And we're going to be walking through the text and looking at different ways that scriptures help us understand that. But here's the thing. This sounds like a TV commercial, but space is limited. Time is limited. And so this is a QR code. And if you click that, you can register for that, and we can save a spot for you in our Wednesday night Bible study to make sure that our room is the right size for you to be able to be a part of that. So we would encourage you, uh, if you're thinking about doing that this week, I want to just let you know we also have a meal at 530 you're invited to, and uh, the Bible study is from 6 to 630. That means that you have then time at 630 to go to the men's Bible studies and the women's Bible studies and to be involved in student program and children's program and to help out in all sorts of different ways here in our church. If you wanna sing in our choir, you can do that at 6.30 after the Bible study. So I wanna invite you to do that and encourage you to do that right now. But what I'd like us to do is to finish this time in prayer. So if you would join me. Our Father, you're the only one that knows the time. And Lord, all we've been given is an assignment. An assignment isn't to know the time. The assignment is to be ready. And you've told us the way to be ready is, has to do with our relationship with you and our relationship with Jesus Christ who came to die in our place, who came to build the eternal bridge between us and you. And Lord, I pray right now at the end of this message and the end of this series, if there's someone watching, someone present in this room, who's never by faith stepped across the bridge of the cross that leads to a restored relationship with a loving God, I pray that this moment would be the moment of decision. That this would be the hour in which someone or someones might say, today is the day I want to make right that relationship with my Lord, my Savior, the one who died for me, the one who rose for me, the one who is ascended and in glory and is returning in power and in glory to put all things to right, that one day the heavens will be shaken, the evil that we know of in our universe will be eradicated, wrong will be no more, that the righteous rule of God will stretch from sea to sea, from one end of the universe to the other, and the Lord God will reign over it all. Lord, in your life, you were humbled, you suffered, but now you reign. And this morning, Lord, I pray that you would not just reign in heaven, but you'd reign in hearts of everyone in this room and everyone who's watching. God, may you rule in every square inch, not only of our lives, but of this entire creation. Lord, move among us, we pray. May your spirit move among us in this place. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with me this morning? We're going to have an invitation. If you'd like to come and pray, if you'd like to come, make any decision, you come as we continue to worship.